Yeah. Yeah, I like to know where all my friends. I used to have a lot of money. I used to dress. Man, I had all kinds of celebrities and everybody all around me. Where are my friends? Hi, I'm Harold Bell, and this is the Legends of Inside Sports and the Way We Were. Well, I want you to fasten on your seats, Bell, because this will be a, a very special show. Uh, my special guest is making a rare appearance. He's a native Washingtonian, community advocate for all people. He is the CEO and publisher of Black Men in America that was founded in 2001. Wow. It is ranked number 14 out of the most popular and read online magazines among Black online websites. The apple of his eye is his two granddaughters. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the Legends of Inside Sports, a guy who's no stranger to Inside Sports, the one and only Mr. Gary Johnson. How are you doing, Gary? I'm doing great, Harold, but I have to tell you, I got a correction for you already. This is breaking local news. Here we go. <laughs> No kidding. Wow. Six. Number yeah. six. Yeah, BET is number one. Black Planet is number two. Black America Web is number three. DallasBlack.com. AfricanAmerica.org. And we are number six. Wow. Man, congratulations, man. I, I know how tough it's been, man, because you've been like a, a, a one-man <laughs> show for this uh, <laughs> online magazine. And yeah. definitely, man, I take my hat off to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I guess how long I've been a part of this now? About ten? How many? Ten years or better, Gary? Yeah, ten years or better. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, yeah. Hey, Gary, I ain't never hung with organization in media that long. <laughs> 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 I make, I make a correction there. At WST, I did hang around a while. Gary, <laughs> Gary, there are a lot of things going on. Uh in our country, and uh, it seems to be divided. I remember in 1968, after the riots, uh, this took over cities all around uh, this country, um, there was a report, the current report came out, uh, a little better, almost a year later, and it said that America was headed for two different uh, divisions. One black and one white. 1968, we were forewarned, Gary. And now we find ourselves in 2019. This country is, is divided. I mean, it's, worse, it's the worst that I've ever seen, Gary. The worst that I've ever seen. Now, I want to lead off the show because what I'm going to do, I'm going to let you take the lead. I'm going to ask you uh, some questions about some different things that have taken place in this country that uh, have not been good. Let's talk. Let's take a look at the at the Mueller report. What did you get out of the Mueller report, Gary? And what conclusion did you come to? Well, I came to the conclusion that there is a whole lot of damaging evidence that they don't want the American public to see because this attorney general was handpicked by a corrupt president, and he auditioned for the job. Now, a lot of people may not remember or realize this, but uh, this Attorney General Barr wrote a 19-page unsolicited letter about the Mueller report and while it was going on, and his main thesis was he did not think a sitting president could be charged with obstruction. Wow, what a coincidence that he gets the Attorney General job and he gets the report. Wow. And so he takes a report that they won't even tell us how many thousands of pages it is. And he summarizes, what, in about 48 hours into four pages? Right, right. Not one complete sentence, but just quoted, just some, some stuff pieced together. And this president has rolled with it. He thinks he's completely exonerated. Mm -hmm. And the letter clearly stated he's not. They can't exonerate him. 
this is crazy, but just like everything else, the truth will come out. There is damaging stuff in there, and it's just a matter of time before it comes out. Well, Gary, it's just one, a matter of time. Gary, one of the things that blows my mind, uh, out of this administration, there were 30 indictments, man, of people who were surrounded by our president. Yeah, you have to wonder, why are all these people who are going indicted, who've been indicted, some of them are going to jail. In the case of Paul Manafort, he will probably die in jail. Mm. Why did all of them, if there was nothing to hide, why did all of them lie about Russia? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Why did they all lie? There was nothing to hide. Wow. Oh, it's coming out. There, what, I think there are, at last count, 17 different investigations around the country uh, with this president and his family and his administration. Yeah. It's I, clearly the most corrupt administration in our history. Yeah. And that and that's saying something. <laughs> yeah. That is saying yeah. something. He acts like a mob boss. Yeah. He really does, man. You know, yeah. um, I understand, man, that uh, the folks in New Jersey and New York City uh, uh are laying a trap for him there because well, uh, they, they know it. They, they grew up with it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, Gary, let's move on, man. Let's take a look at uh, something that that just broke loose, and uh, Jesse uh, Smollett uh, has had all sixteen charges dropped <laughs> by by the by the Chicago Police Department and his prosecutor, and uh, he's he. He's walking away free. Is that is that the real deal, Gary? All right, I tell you what. He walked out of that courthouse free, but he will never be free. Right. He will never be free because, and I may make a lot of people upset, and I know there's, you know, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, but I firmly believe, because I know what my eyes tell me, and I've looked at some of the facts and what the details are, it certainly looks to me like this guy staged his own attack. Mm -hmm. And now the prosecutor said, well, you know, for these low-level felonies, we often make these kind of deals. Well, this guy's a celebrity, and he gets two days of community service, and he's forfeiting his bond. Well, his bond was $10,000. Mm -hmm. So that's like paying the paying them $10,000 for two days of community service, and they sealed everything so that as if it never happened. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened. Yeah. Well, you know, I am, um, I, you know, what, what blows my mind more than anything else, man, is that the mayor and the police chief and one of the prosecutors called a press conference. Now, we know how justice and just us works in Chicago and has yeah. worked like this for decades. I have yeah. yet to hear the mayor or the, or the police chief or the prosecutor call a press conference when a black person has been shot unarmed in the yeah. streets of Chicago. Go, the, it goes to the grand jury. The grand jury finds this individual, this individual cop, not guilty. Have you ever heard the mayor or the police chief say, hey, well, this guy was guilty, and, uh, and, 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 we, think, and we think that he did all of these crimes. They, they've never done that with, a, with a, 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 a cop in Chicago. So now why are you doing this for Jesse Smollett? Why? It does make you wonder, and it makes you wonder about celebrity and money. Mm -hmm. Celebrity and money, because how can you say justice was served? What about those two brothers, those two brothers from Africa? That's what, right. What is their position now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, one of, one of my problems, and I was saying this while this whole thing was going on, and like you said, this guy's never going to be free. I said he didn't hurt anyone but himself. You understand? Yep. He didn't hurt anyone but himself. So when they, uh, you know, just dropped all charges, I say, well, that's what I thought was going to happen anyway. But like <laughs> you said, but like you said, Gary, he's never going to be free. What part did these two brothers play? Where are they now? What they made false statements to the 
uh, to the cops. If, it, if this is how it's supposed to go, they're supposed to be arrested for making false, false statements to the uh, law enforcement. Yeah, they said they were paying $3,500 with the promise of $500 afterwards. And the police said that they put all this together with 55 police and private surveillance cameras. And, you know, they showed those guys at the store and they were buying the stuff that allegedly was used in the attack. I mean, it's a pretty damning evidence, but now it's all seen like we, we never even heard. We never, I guess you're supposed to forget this. Like what, men in black, they put the pen in your face and all of a sudden it never happened. <laughs> Right, right. This is this is uh this is really weird. But also now he's got to see if he's going to be allowed to come back on the show where he was one of the main characters in that show. Are they going to allow him back? I was watching the talk today, and they took a, a poll of the audience. Eighty-seven percent of the audience say he shouldn't be allowed back on the show. But but check this out. Guess what? The one of the main characters, the star of the show, Tadja B. Henson said. She said she felt all along that Jesse had not committed uh, this this crime, what they call it, and and that she's glad that he has been exonerated. So when somebody like that on the show, uh, uh, you know, is in your corner, that's powerful, man. Well, you know, she can be in his corner all she wants, but the last two episodes have been their lowest rating. Rate, rate no kidding. Shows. Wow. They're wow. tanking. So she can be in this corner, but as you know, in the media business, money talks. Yeah. And if they're not pulling in the audiences, that's right. And the last two shows, and they're on tonight, and if it dips another night, I mean, somebody's not making money. Somebody's going to have to get knocked off. Mm -hmm. I think the show's on its last leg anyway. I do too. I, I've been yeah. I've been stopped watching it. I, yeah, I, I, I was I was done after the first season. Yeah, yeah, I was too. Tell you the truth. Well, while while we are talking about uh, scams, things going on. What about this college scam, uh, Gary? What about this college scam? You know, white folks have always said that black folks don't uh, deserve um, affirmative action. <laughs> and that they're going, they're going to school in place of some other uh, um, uh, eligible or honorable a white kid. Now we come out with this scam where millions of dollars look like we're in play to get these white kids into these elite colleges around the country. Yeah, that's really, again, money and celebrity and people on the tape. There because you go. Some of them have their pictures, like they're playing sports and they never even played the sport. <laughs> uh, the, the academics, it, it, again, celebrity and money. And, uh, and it, it really hurts people who worked hard to get in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, I mean, that... I thought, you know, when they first say when they take, seize this guy's uh, bank account, the, the the brain trust of the scam, that they found fifty two million, but it was five point two million that he had in his account. That's still a lot of money, you know. But the kind of money that these uh, celebrities were willing to dish out, man, to so their kids could get into these schools, man, it just blows my mind, man. And uh, and I'm thinking about a lot of our uh, black institutions, our colleges are on their last legs, uh, uh, right. <laughs> uh, Gary. So, yeah. and we can't even, and, and, the, and the scholarships and some of these, it really throws, it really makes you wonder about some of the people who've come out of these schools now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how long has this been going on? And maybe uh, some of these people are frauds. They're just lazy slugs who had wealthy parents. Mm -hmm. White privilege. Gary was called well, white yeah, privilege. Yeah, you got to <laughs> call it what it is. And while we're talking about education, Gary, let's talk about education that, that surrounds us in our community. You know, um, uh, there, it has been uncovered in the Prince George's County school system that administrators have been stealing money from, from our children, man. You know, and they have taken it upon themselves to be judge, jury, and all the rest, not reporting the crimes to the to the police. They have not reported these crimes uh, of money missing from the, the school system. Also, 
in, in Park Parkland, uh, one of these schools on PG County, the school is, I mean, the, the condition of the school is deplorable. And the, the kids have taken a photo, I mean, uh, uh, videos of rodents uh, par par parading around in their classrooms. See, this is unconscionable, and this is supposed to be one of the most affluent That's right. black counties in the country. Mm -hmm. It just goes to show you where our priorities are, because the, the administration is fat with uh, not being focused on education. Uh, and I got to tell you, because I had two two sons in the school system, and I was active in the school, but you don't find a lot of these parents active. Now, maybe that's, they'll say, well, we, we got these big houses and they got to work all the time, but, you know, money is not everything, and you talk about education and being involved. This is what happens when you just, and, and you know, kids, some, some of these kids, bad, bad, no mm -hmm. home training. Mm -hmm. they, they're not in school to learn, a lot of them. It's not their fault. So you can't blame some of these kids because they have horrible parents and a corrupt school system. Mm, that's right. It, it's really, really unsettling. And then people want to know, well, why is everybody trying to go to private school? Why are they trying to go to charter school? Because of stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a scam. That's a sham, too, uh, the charter schools. Right. These private schools are a scam. Why are you taking money? from the public school system and, and putting it in the charter school system. A, lo a lot of people don't understand. You know, they hear about LeBron James got his own school. Um, Jalen Rose got his own school in Detroit. That's a bunch of bull. You cannot own a public school. You cannot own a public school, man. But it, it's a contradiction in terms. It is. So right. our kids, man, our kids are in trouble, you know. I spoke at this, uh, my wife, Patty, and I spoke at an elementary school in PG County a couple of weeks ago, man, fifth and sixth graders. Uh, elementary has always been uh, my niche. You know, that that's where I, I, I laid all my emphasis on the elementary school child because I found out as I was working out there in the streets and playgrounds and the courts and everything that these middle school kids and high school kids, they thought they knew as much as I did anyway. So they were very difficult uh, to handle, but it was always a challenge to me because I was a knucklehead when I was in school. So I'm Captain Knucklehead, so I understand the game. But I decided to put all emphasis on the elementary school kid because, number one, Gary, when you lay that foundation and you understand exactly where I'm coming from because of your two granddaughters, you are laying that foundation for them to be a success. And they are so... Uh, they are open to all things, all things. They're listening to you. They're watching your every move, girl. These kids are watching your every move. So I tell everybody, you know, that these kids did not come out of their mother's womb with an AK-47 using the N-word, MF, right. or with a Ku Klux Klan robe on, using the N-word. This is all learned behavior from adults. All yeah. learned behavior from adults. Go ahead, girl. No, no, you're right. And you, you know, you know my son Chris. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's funny we're talking about this because I sent him an email last night, and I wanted him to know that I thought that he is a very good dad, and I wanted to just give him some some positive reinforcement because. Mm -hmm. You know, he's looking. For, he's always looking for a job, and he's working now. But I told him the most important job that you will have in your life is being a dad. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're a good one, and you always have room for improvement. But I think it's important for him to know that mm -hmm. somebody recognizes, and not just somebody, his own father, yes, right. recognizes that he is a good father to his daughter. Mm -hmm. And some of these black fathers don't get the do. They don't get their just do. Not that they should look for it, because that's what we're supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know? And so you, you need to stay with your kids, spend time with them. It's not always about money. And sometimes it's just giving them those hugs and being around and guiding them so that they have some positive role models. Yeah. You know, Gary, um, I was, um, you know, my I don't know if you read my latest, latest blog or not, but it was on Johnny Dawkins. See, the most important game being played in the world today is not football, basketball, or baseball. 
It's the game called life. That is the only game being played where being called a superstar really means something today, especially when you see what's going on in our communities as far as this racism and our kids are concerned, Gary. So so what you're doing with Chris, and I had a chance to uh, work with him. Uh, he's a very bright young man, and uh, I think he, his future is, is unlimited. But like you say, the most important job that he has right now is raising his two girls. One girl. Oh, that's right. Okay. All and, right. Uh, and, and and being able to work constructively with their mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. that these girls will see some positive images, you know, in families. And, and both of my sons have very, very good mothers. Mm-hmm. That's and fantastic. Have very good mothers. So that is I'm, fantastic. I'm thankful for that. Right. Well, Gary, let's move on. Let's take a let's let's move into the entertainment world now. You know, the Oscars uh, awards were just on, and of course there was a lot of uh, hoopla about Spike Lee getting his first Oscar. <laughs> whole lot of whole lot of hoopla, and of course uh, last time Spike was up for the Oscar, uh, uh, my man uh, beat him out driving Miss Daisy. What's his What's his name? Morgan, Morgan, Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, he was a, a black man driving a white woman around town. And beat us and beat Spike Lee out uh, for the Oscar. This time he was up for it, and guess what? Who beat him out for the, the best picture? It was a white guy driving a black guy around town. <laughs> so, so you know something is wrong with that. Spike ended up getting uh, the Oscar. What did he get it for, Gary? Can you remember? Uh, Oh, okay. oh, oh, yeah, a uh, Klansman, the Klansman, yeah, yeah, the Klansman, yeah, yeah, Klansman. the Klansman. But the thing is, we would have remembered Gary if he had got the uh, best picture uh, award. But since it wasn't for the best picture, we don't. I don't even remember what he got the award for. But it was not for the best picture. And I went to see, finally went to see the Klansman after they may uh, uh, gave him his award, and I really enjoyed that that picture because. Man, that took a lot of courage, man, for that brother. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. tell you, that took a lot of courage because that could have gone either way, man. Either way. He wouldn't have been allowed to tell it if it went the other way. I'm telling you, man, that was I take my hat off to Spike and uh and, and the and the brother who went undercover. And see, let me tell you something, Gary. That's what has to happen if we ever going to bring law enforcement under control. Black brothers are gonna have to stand up, whether it's undercover out of the color, they got to stand up, man, because what is happening, this police brutality and racism is all over this country when it comes to law enforcement. And we got to remember, we got to remember this, and folks don't understand, and you know, I, I was the first one to ever come out with this guy, you know that, that the FOP or FOB, whatever it is, they're the Ku Klux Klan. Yep. They're the Ku Klux Klan, man. And we don't understand that. I have two brothers in law enforcement, and they're not here today. My brother, uh, Bobby, my older brother, was a U.S. Marshal for 20 years. My, my younger brother, Earl, was a D.C. cop for 14 years, and they both faced the thin blue line, and, and, and what's that other thing, girl? Wall of uh, the blue, what's it called, the blue wall? They faced both of them because they tried to be good cops and take care of the community. And they don't want good cops. They don't want good cops. Well, remember, my mother was an they, EPD. That's right. Sergeant, and she retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to, these guys used to come by the, my house when I was a kid having study sessions. Uh, Kilman O'Brien, Bertel Jefferson, mm. and all these guys. Two of the know? best. Two of the best, man. Uh, Tillman O'Brien. I walk. I worked with Tillman O'Brien and Bertel Jefferson, man. Yeah. And they Ike were, uh, yeah. Well, I eat food, what you can have. But, uh, <laughs> but, but Bertel and Tillman O'Brien, man, they were officer friendly. The real. Yeah. They knew yeah. what was going on in their community, man. There are some good cops out there. It's no doubt. There's some good white and black cops out there. But let, let me tell you something. 
When these guys start standing up and talking about it's us against them, I have to look at them like they're crazy. Are you kidding me, man? You did. You were not drafted into this job. You volunteered for this job, Gary. And working for the community. And working for the community, being paid by the community. Yeah. And they've been brainwashed, man, with this with this uh, thin blue line and, and blue wall, man, talking about it's us against them. You got to be kidding me, man. Got to be kidding me. So we got we got a, we got a long road ahead of us, man. And uh, in my lifetime, I just don't see any uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel, man. Because there are, like I said, some good cops coming. But you take that that guy who's the chief of police in Chicago. He's a bad cop, man. He's a bad cop. I'm gonna tell you. I know him when I see him. I work in the community with him for 50 years, so I know him when I'm saying he is not. He cares nothing about the community. He is part of the problem. Is well, this the one that was uh, up there with the press conference? Yeah. With Mayor, uh, Rahm yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah, the, the superintendent of the cops. Yeah, there. yeah, man. He's a bad apple, man. Oh, man. Well, let's move on to uh, the Super Bowl. As you know, the Super Bowl, uh, a lot of controversy, uh, of course, especially in New Orleans when the. Uh, no call, no call was made. But what blew my mind at the Super Bowl, a lot of people thought that Gladys Knight should not perform at the Super Bowl. I didn't agree with that. Uh, it was in her hometown. Gladys Knight is on the way out and not on the way in. I understand she put on a terrific performance at the MGM uh, a couple of nights ago. But Gladys Knight, uh, she's not going to get many more opportunities like that. And for her to sing the national anthem, I didn't think it was a big thing. But what blew my mind was uh, was the flip of the coin <laughs> in the middle of the field. And I look down there, and what do I see? I see Bernie's uh, King, Martin Luther King's daughter. Yeah. I see uh, Andrew Young, one of the black leaders in Atlanta. And I see John Lewis, who is my hero. My hero. There's no doubt about it. He's my hero. This man took this took billy clubs across his skull. Yeah. Locked up, man. Bloody. I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Why were they at 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 the at midfield for the flip of the corn when we have the biggest racist institution, slave mentality in the National Football League? You have no black owners. This is 2019. And I've been talking about this since I was on started on the air in 1972. This is plantation, folks. This is a plantation. The black ball players don't have the courage to stand up. They had the owners. All they had to do was sit out one game. But when the owners threw that money in front of them to use in the community, that's where it all went wrong. Now, you know, this might be an unfair question because all three of them, uh, I would take the daughter out of it, mm -hmm. you know, but they were disciples of Dr. King. Right. Now, do you think if he was alive today oh, that man. Dr. King would have been on that field? No. No way. He would have been outside with, with, with thousands or hundreds out there uh, uh, boycotting the game. Taking a knee. Taking a knee. Taking a knee. He's been taking a knee. Him and Colin Kaepernick would have been together. Uh, and Eric Reed. They would have been out in front of that stage. Now, I know you say they take the daughter out, but that was one of the problems. She has a reputation. If she's not being paid, she she don't want no part of what's going on. Oh, I know. That King family is split. Yeah, they are they split. So, so she was being paid to be down there. Now was Andrew Young? Was uh, John Lewis also being paid? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I know, that, I know that King family, with the children left, they are split. I mm. think Dexter is running the foundation. I know that they've been, um, the, 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 the children have been uh, at times against each other. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's with good. how that, uh, how their father's, uh, uh, legacy is being uh, run right. with the King Foundation. Some of it's uh, been some of them have been accused of being a little greedy with the money and the licensing, mm -hmm. um, and others, 
you know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's a shame that the siblings have to fight and that it's been so public. Yeah. Because I think that's something that their parents would not have wanted. No, it's, oh, it's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. On, on another issue dealing with the National Football League, Gary, Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed. Colin Kaepernick led the fight uh, to take the NFL to court. And when all was said and done, it is said that they got less than $10 million, man, from the NFL. I, that was unbelievable to me. Why take him to court if you could settle for $10 million? He, that, man, they, he lost more than that by, by taking the knee. That's a drop in the bucket, man. Now, if I if they it settled for fifty, sixty, a hundred million, I said, okay, maybe it was worth it. But man, it was not worth it, Colin Kaepernick. Don't they pay that commissioner Roger Goodell more than ten million a year? Oh, it's no doubt about it. I think he made something like thirty-four. Yeah, million. yeah, yeah. He in the thirty, me in the thirty million, man. So, like you said, this was a drop in the bucket. Now, what? Let me tell you something. The NFL is going to come back and they go be bitten in the butt. Let me tell you why. This NFL rule change on past interference is a challenge. Now, legalized gambling, Gary, that was a big mistake, man. Come on, man. Legalized gambling in sports? Yeah. Come on. And they put the team in Las Vegas? And the team in Las Vegas, man. Somebody dropped somebody dropped the ball, man, on this. This ball was dropped. They set themselves up to have a big scandal. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's no doubt about it. They set themselves up to have a big scandal. I mean, this guy in that New Orleans game was standing right there. He could almost touch the players, and he didn't see <laughs> pass interference. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Gary, what about uh, the exit of Antonio Brown and Lavelle, Lavon Bell from uh, Pittsburgh, man? Uh, did did they win the lottery or what? Well, you know, I guess it depends on how they define success, but I don't know. I'm not so sure that where they go, just because they got talent, that doesn't guarantee wins. Mm-hmm. It's chemistry, and I guess I guess in the court, the case of AB uh, Antonio, he was a top flight receiver. I, he one of the best. Didn't appear, yeah, he did appear mm -hmm. to want to be there in Pittsburgh unless he because I guess long as Ben is there, he's not gonna get all the shine. Mm -hmm. And so now he's with the Raiders. Uh, so we'll see, but I. I I hope, he, I hope it worked out well for him. Well, let me, let me tell you something, what I think, man, and just, uh, just being an observer and uh, watching, uh, I think uh, the problem in Pittsburgh was the coach, man, because... Oh, uh, Tomlin? Yeah, Tomlin's the coach. Yeah, he, he's the problem. He should have addressed all of this, man, with Big Ben and Antonio Brown from the beginning. It should have never gotten to this stage, man. You understand? Yeah. It should have never gotten to this stage. Tomlin is well respected. I think he's a good coach, but he blew this one. He, he blew did, this he one. He may have punted that ball to management when maybe he should have got involved. That's right. That's right. He should have got involved. And even, you know, LeVon Bell sitting out, he'd never get that money back. But I think it, what it was all about with LeVon Bell was peace of mind, man. I need to be out of here because these people are going to use me up. And, and I'm going to be no good when I become a free agent. So he decided to sit that year out and, and, and gamble. So now he's in, in New York, uh, which of course you know is the top media market. And uh I think I think that's a good move. I just hate to see the New York Jets get a, get rid of uh Todd Bowles, man. Wasn't it was it Todd? Todd Bowles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hate to see them get rid of Todd Bowles. I think he's an, an excellent coach, man. And we're talking about black coaches and their exit. What do you think about? I think we what we got, Gary, two or three black coaches out of 30 teams in the NFL, no black owners. What good yeah. is what good is the Rooney rule, Gary? What good is the Rooney rule? It looks like the Rooney rule has run its course because nobody seems to be uh, putting any teeth in it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, hot, the hot coaches now are the young white boys. Mm-hmm. 
in their twenties. Yeah. We had one of them on the staff here at the Redskins, but we let him go to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, now football, I think, among all the major sports, is probably the worst in terms of players being compensated because outside of a signing bonus, you can get dropped like a hat. I mean, mm -hmm. like a hot it. potato, like a hot potato. Yeah, you mm -hmm. tear up your knee or get hit or something like that. And it, 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 you're just expendable. They just throw you on a scrap heap. Mm -hmm. And with all these uh, CTEs and concussions, yeah, no, yeah. they, they they really put their lives on the line. So if they can get their money and walk away good, I mean that's good. Look, look at Gronkowski, 29 years old, and he threw. He said he, he threw. threw. He broke it up. He yeah. threw at 29. Yeah. I hope hopefully he put his money away because it sounds like he did. He he never he never cashed a check. He just you he he survived off uh. A uh, uh, promotional advertiser, you know, the yeah. advertiser. So that's yeah. great. He was smart there as long as, you know, as he did something like that. But, Gary, when we look at sports, sports overall, especially pro sports, man, the racism, man, is just blatant, man. You know, even the NBA, uh, people look at the NBA and say, well, you know, they, they're ahead of the game. But also, we have, uh, we don't have, we don't have, I don't think we got three coaches uh, in the, in in the NBA, three black coaches in the NBA, man. With Major League Baseball, I think we got two black managers. Yeah, that's right. And no black owners again. We got one black owner in the NBA, and that's Michael Jordan. And you almost forget about him. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's he's low profile. He's he low. <laughs> He could, he could care less, man. I said, I got mine. You got yours to get. That was like the te some of the teachers used to tell us, you know? Yeah, yep. Stop acting a fool. I got mine. You yeah. Got to get. And, as, and as we uh, close out this, this pro sports thing here, uh, what about Bryce Hopper and, and, and what, Mike Trout, man? They're the highest paid in the game night, uh, now. Uh, Hopper got something like 330000 and Mike Trout got... <laughs> Trout got uh, four hundred and, and some odd millions. So yeah, you know Bryce, we don't. Bryce thought he was the hottest man for about two minutes. Yeah, about two minutes. <laughs> and Trout came along. Yeah, but it, it's it's amazing, man. They can find the money for all these athletes, but they can't find money for our kids, man. They can't oh, find money for the kids. teachers, teachers, especially teachers, who are the most important, most important person. In, in in our system are our teachers and they they won't pay them man they won't pay them teachers are underpaid and I I'm telling you man when I look at what's going on around us today man it, it's a it, it's it's not it's not a it's not a great sight man it's but this is sacrifice. why community activism is so important and I keep trying to get people to be active in the community it's not just voting every four years for a president mm -hmm. it's it's school board it's mm -hmm. community Well, Gary, and, you know, uh, it takes, I don't know what we have to do to get people, more people involved to help these teachers who are trying to educate our kids, especially the ones that are dedicated, not the ones who are just trying to slide by. Mm -hmm. Well, Gary, I can tell you what the problem is, man. It's very simple, man. A lack of courage, man. We've got to have courage, man. You can't buy courage, uh, Gary. You can't fake courage. You either got to have it or you don't have it. One day, he said, his name was Floyd Dickens out of Cincinnati, Ohio. He said, uh, courage is the willingness to act on what you believe to be true. That's right, man. That's and right. not a lot of people have the guts to do that. That's right. They're worried about rocking the boat. Mm -hmm. But if you want to use a boat analogy, if the ship sinks, everybody gets wet. That's right. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, let's move into March Madness. And, of course, a big game, a big, big game was uh, a Duke uh, taking on UCF, uh, UCF and uh, the final score, Duke barely survived. And guess who it was? It was a guy who was, it was the mentee and the mentor, Johnny Dawkins, going up against Mike Krzyzewski. And, uh, man, that was some kind of game, man, I tell you. Yeah. Talking about his protege.
protege uh, on the other side of the court there. And, um, it, I mean, it was a good game. It was a good game. Mm -hmm. Well, you can read you can read my story on uh, on Johnny Dawkins. Uh, in fact, uh, like I said, man, th this guy is a, is a is a he's a superstar in the game called life, man. He is one of the most humble individuals that I've ever met. I was planning on doing this story, this story, this blog story on Johnny Dawkins two years ago when he came down to Ben's Chili Bowl with his Stanford basketball team. Surprised me and. Uh, he, the, the really surprise was not only the success of Johnny, but also Johnny had one of his homeboys with him, uh, a brother by the name of Charlie Payne, called him Mookie. And uh, when I discovered that, I said, man, this is what it's all about, pulling others along with you as you go up the ladder of success. And what made this a great story is that uh, uh, Mookie's grandfather was my mentor. Every Payne, we call him Cookie. He was a former D.C. cop, one of the first black D.C. cops hired. And he walked the Northeast Beat in the rain, in the cold, in the snow, in the wind. Because guess what? Black cops were not allowed to ride in the cars until years later. And Mr. Payne was one of the greatest all-around athletes to come out of Washington, D.C., and guess what? He hung out at the Langston Golf Course. He was a hell of a golfer. He was a scratch golfer. And then he come over to the spin golf field and he coached knuckleheads like me. <laughs> and he taught me how to run the down and out, which was my favorite pass pattern. And it made me unstoppable. And I became an all high wide receiver because of Mr. Payne. And he kept me from getting kicked off the team because I always wanted the ball. And I will upset my coach. Oh, yeah, man. He think Terrell Owens wanted the ball all the time. I wanted the ball thrown to me. If the game was on the line, and this was in football, basketball, and baseball because I played all three, and I got in trouble in all three. I wanted the ball in my hands when the game is on the line. And that is the same way that the game of life should be played. You should have courage enough to stand up. And I, I thank Mr. Payne. I'm glad I got a chance to write this story and thank him and thank Johnny Dawkins, man, for pulling uh, Mookie along with him. So uh, Charlie, Charlie Payne, you did a great job uh, with your son. Uh, uh, Mr. Payne, you did a great job with your boys. Doc Payne was his oldest son. My teammate is been gone. Skeez it. Carl Payne was my uh, my my teammate has been gone. It was it was like a family, and and Mr. Payne and Coach Dave Brown, who saved my life, really, uh, were the really they 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 they, they were the real heroes, man. And uh, I I look back now, man, and I think about where I am. I would not be here if it was not been had not been for Dave Brown and Mr. Everett Payne. You know, Gary, as we get, get ready to head out of here. Is telling a lie and perpetrating a fraud, is that now the norm, Gary, uh, in our community or in America? You know, over time when things go unchallenged, they seem normal. And that's why we have to stand up and challenge these things. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not careful, this will seem like the norm. Just that's like right. the lowering of the bar. Uh, for the presidency. Mm -hmm. Whoever thought you'd have a president so immoral, so vulgar, mm -hmm. so with such a lack of empathy. And, it, and he, he's the leader of the free world acting like that. Mm -hmm. And it, some of it spills over. Yeah. And so we got to really be careful and stop copying people mm -hmm. and going back to doing what we need to do as a community and act like we got some sense. Yeah. And as you said, exercise courage. Mm -hmm exercise courage you know i ride the subway a lot and sometimes i have to model the appropriate behavior during rush hour and get my ass up so a woman can have that seat or mm -hmm. just offer to her mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of these kids man oh we got to, but they don't know they don't they know don't they know. Don't know they don't know girl they don't know they have yeah. not been taught man they don't know they haven't been taught and, and you know one of the first things when i talk to young people man and uh 
and they they don't allow you to say a lot of things in in these schools today when you talk to young people. That's what we really lost it. Is that uh, your ancestors were kings and queens and not hooligans and thugs. The stuff that you see on on YouTube and and on these uh these off channels. That is not us, man. We come from a proud, proud people, yep. a proud people, man. And when when I can when I see a, a black media per, a personality who it passes for white, and he's still on, on 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 television telling lies, I'm saying, man, is this the norm now? I just it, you know I went down to the way in, Gary. We were talking about that the, the Peterson uh, boys fought down the MGM. So I had taken myself out of that environment for a long time, that boxing uh, environment, because there are so many frauds in uh, pro professional boxing. But I told my man, I said, come on, let's ride down here and see what's happening. So I rode down there. And uh, one, of the, one of the first guys I run into is Mark Tushab Johnson. Now, oh, okay. now Mark Tushab Johnson, I've known him since a baby. His brother, his father, Ham, and I were partners. And Ham was just as crazy as he could be, but Ham was my man, and he had my back. So now, Mark, they got all the publicity. See, boxers in this town in the early days, they, they didn't have nobody, no show but Inside Sports or me writing for the Afro. You understand? So, like, I was like the PR man for all the guys, really, most of the guys. Sean Bay Mitchell, all of them. They came through Harold Bell. But... You know one of the first things that, that Mark Two Sharp Johnson and Mark Two Sharp Johnson let's say it is is the best pound for pound fighter to come out of Washington D.C. He just worked in those small weights where the money wasn't there, really there. He really didn't get paid. But Mark should know how the game is played. See, it did. When Mark asked me when he saw me, uh, uh, Gary Harold, are they still trying to alienate you? I had to, I had to take a, a look at him. Alienate me. It's, it's too late to alienate me. <laughs> 50 should have tried that 50 years ago. My history is already in stone. But see, anybody who try to alienate me at this time in, in my life is either an educated fool or a damn fool. Because, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a free. I'm a free black man. So the people that I've helped and then... I, I go to Facebook. Sometimes, Gary, I don't know how you go. I just go to Facebook just to browse to see what people are talking about. And today I was browsing through Facebook, and I saw this guy, Johnny Lord, that went to Anacostia, athlete at Anacostia, great basketball player. And he was on there, and they were talking about Glenn Harris and uh, uh, another great friend, Larry, uh, Lawrence Johnson. And Johnny Lord was saying how much Glenn Harris meant to him and helped him get where he is today. I said, now, here's another damn fool. <laughs> Johnny Lord had big problems at Anacostia when he was on the basketball team. My coach, Dave Brown, went from Spangon to Anacostia. So Coach Brown calls me one night and said, Harold, I need for you to come over to school because we got we, we got one of those kids. He He's off the chain like you. He's a great athlete, but he's getting ready to get his butt kicked out of school. I need you to come over here and deal with him. So I did. I went over there, uh, guy, and, you know, he think he a hot shot a basketball player. He, he didn't know nothing about my game. So we we end up on the basketball court with a basketball. He challenged me, you know. So guess, guess what, guy? I kicked his ass. You hear what I'm saying? I kicked his butt. And guess what, guy? I went, he kept begging me to play another game, but I knew I had him, guy. I knew I had him, so I didn't play another game. He went on to graduate from American University, got a scholarship, uh, married some young lady who was a TV uh, a, a, a media uh, anchor in, in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, but he never came back and did anything in the community. But we know this is a story that goes on and on. But don't show up on Facebook talking about what somebody else did for you, and you don't remember Coach Dave Brown calling Harold Bell to come over to set you straight. So I'm saying we, we got selected memory, Gary. Why is it that we have selected memories in our community, Gary? <laughs> it's easier, and it, it keeps us from doing the real hard work. Yeah. Some people think we're brainwashed. Some people are. 
Yeah, maybe so. Some people have this thing that the white man's ice is colder. Yeah, yeah. But you have a thing, but you have a very good saying about white people. You got, and I, it's really true. Yeah, every you black know? face you see is not your brother, and every white face is not your enemy, man. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I learned that by trial and error. Johnny Lord and and the rest of these guys, like uh, John Thompson and James Brown and Sugar Ray Leonard, man, they're, they're the best example. I lived it. So that's why I am so familiar with what goes on and, and seeing these selective memories in our community that people say they're brainwashed. And you see the Mark II Sharp Johnson who don't realize or have forgotten somewhere. And Johnny Lord, man, you know, white privilege is out there, uh, Gary, and you know, you heard the Dale Hanson piece and the Stephen A. Smith uh, blog that I that I wrote. Tim, as we as we head out of here, man, I want to ask you honestly, man. I don't know if you read the. Um, I know I know you had to read them. Uh, of course, with the Rock Newman piece and the and the Dale Hanson and Stephen A. Smith uh, piece on white privilege. That, that's what I want. I want to know: Is this the norm now? Uh, your you, your website had moved from from. 14 to number six in the top 50. So that means people are, are reading what's going on. How do people read me, girl? You know what? This, people are going to think this is a setup. <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously. I, I was going to send you something. I'm actually in the office right now. I'm uh, looking at the, the stats, and there's a page that says, Where do black men in America.com's visitors come from? And so their visitors, most of our visitors, are over 45% of the people find us by way of a search engine. So now I looked at the top keywords, and I'm going to send this to you so okay. you'll see it on email, mm -hmm. but the top keywords from search engines. Number one, Harold Bell. Ooh. Wow. Number one, top Ooh. keywords from search engines, wow. which are the keywords that send traffic to this site. Harold Bell is number one. Number two, that people type into the search engine, African-American spending habits. Number three is black consumers. Wow. Number four is black yacht club. And number five is the all-in-one master tonic. Wow. That's something I drink. <laughs> <laughs> man, that is, that is a surprise, man. You yeah, know... <laughs> but I'm glad I'm glad you got it in writing, girl. Hey, man, I just want to say, man, thank you uh, so much uh, for being there, man, and, and doing the great job that you're doing in media, man. See, because we don't own any media outlets. We don't own any CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, you name them. We don't, we don't own the USA Today or Washington Post. So our image is being controlled. And uh, thanks to Black Men in America and, and Tom Joyner and those people, if you're not going to get uh, the, the, the information, honestly, unless you tune in uh, to uh, uh, the blogs like blackmeninamerica.com. And, Gary, I want to thank you again for the great job that you, uh, you've been doing, man. And, and keep up the great work, man. I appreciate your support, man. Thank you for being on the site, and you check your email later. You'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, Gary. Thank you, babe. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, that was Gary Johnson, the CEO and publisher of BlackMenInAmerica.com. And I want you folks to remember, you know, that every black face you see is not your brother, and every white face you see is not your enemy. And I don't have to w wonder where all my friends are. I know where they are. They're the ones that are looking for the two. Until next time, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone.